We begin in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, to whom all praise is due. We ask him to send the peace and blessing and mercy on his final messenger, Muhammad, and all of those who follow him until the day of judgment. Today we're talking about um, the fourth pillar of faith in Islam, which is the belief in revelation. And revelation is, we're going to talk about in detail, but when we say scripture, holy writings... Revelation is the source or the reference point or the foundation for Scripture. So we ask, what is Revelation? Very simply put, it is the way God communicates His message. That's what Revelation is. Um, you have people that talk about a personal relationship with God. I even had one lady cutting my hair one time who told me that God speaks to her. And... That's not, that's not how it works. God sent prophets with scriptures and revelation, and it has been recorded, and that's how we know it. It's both the process of God sending his message to a person, as well as the record of it, the actual scripture. So that's, we refer to both of those as revelation. The prophet is receiving revelation, God is communicating to that prophet, um, and then God has an inspired or, or commanded the prophets and their followers to inscribe and uh, record the revelation, which we call scripture. This is the verse of the Qur'an that tells us this point very clearly. And I want to make sure that we all understand that as Muslims, we are principled carriers of knowledge. Any knowledge, as we were talking about earlier on a different subject. But when it comes to revelation in scripture, it's a very serious business. So we should never say, you should believe as such, or I believe as such, unless you know an actual reference from the Holy Quran, or what we'll talk about uh, shortly, the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Otherwise, you're just claiming things about the divine, about the absolute truth of existence and reality itself as it relates to us conscious moral people without knowledge. And that's been rebuked and blamed in very strong ways in the Qur'an to speak about God and His message without knowledge. And pretty much all religions are founded on that. Just people saying stuff and making ideas, philosophizing without a real reference. Or people using what is a scripture, but you say, how can we prove, are you ready, that that scripture is revelation, right? So when, when we look at different scriptures, we say, okay, those sound like very beautiful teachings. It's, it sounds holy and sacred. How do we know that was taught by a prophet? Meaning it is actual revelation and not just the writings of human beings, um, so God does not speak to a human being except by the means of revelation, behind a veil, or by sending a messenger whom he inspires with revelation. So to give you a kind of clarity about what's being said here, Rev God does not spe speak to a human being except by revelation. This is talking about prophets. Because in our previous uh, lesson, we talked about prophets. Those are the people who receive direct messages from God. Those are the people who are communicating the message of God. Right, Messengers are the ones who are given a full scripture and law, and prophets are the ones who communicate and maintain and revive that for the people. So that first part is understood to be that. Behind a veil, um, we know one specific instance uh, that that refers to, and that is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was invited up to the highest of the heavens in the um, uh, night journey and ascension, the Isra al Mi'raj. And then when he came far up to the seventh heaven, Angel Gabriel said, I am not permitted, I cannot go beyond here. And then the Prophet Muhammad went on and he said, I was in front of a permeating light, a very powerful light, the light that was just so profound. Now some companions debated about that. Was that God he was looking at? Or was that something that emanates from God's power or will. And so the majority of the scholars uh, understand it to be that God has a veil of light, as it were. Um, now, we are never supposed to assume what God is or how God looks. Now, God also refers to himself as Nuru samawati wal ard. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. Okay, so that takes us to the next point. Revelation serves as the guiding light and a source of divine law for humanity. When we say a guiding light, meaning 
giving you clarity from a moral standpoint about who I am, what I am, where I came from, what I'm doing here, what's going on around me, how do I make sense of it, and what is my purpose, right? So then the specific details of how to operate in this world, how to live, is the divine law. And so that's what scripture is there to do. That is what the revelation is doing. So here in Surah Al-Ma'idah, God says, Certainly we sent the Torah to Moses as a guiding light. By it, the prophets would rule in submission to God's will. And so that's always been, as we talked about before, the way of God, God's religion, as it were, is not like related to a group of people on earth or a person on earth, such as all the isms and the Christianity and Judaism and Buddhism and all of those are going back to a person, right? Islam to do God's will. A Muslim, one who is trying to do God's will, one who is claiming a commitment to do God's will. So that's how all prophets were taught. That's what all prophets fund- fundamentally told. This is God's revelation and we must follow it. Do His will, right? Islam. Very simple. Continuing, what is revelation? Generally speaking, revelation affirms God and the purpose of life in similar terms. Meaning what? All revelations have the same idea about who is God. Because God is the one telling people about Himself. When somebody suggests that At one point, for example, and this is not to disrespect anybody, it's just the facts, okay? We're just sticking with historical, actual, their own claim to belief. So, according to Jewish history, the entire Jewish history, the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments is very, very succinct and overt that God is one. And God has never been anything other than simply one. Absolutely, purely one God. There is no other. God is not separate into different entities. There has never been any notion of God having a son that is the same as himself or that there's this separate being called a Holy Spirit that is separate but still the same as himself or as a different manifestation of himself. None of those ideas are there in the entire Jewish history. So here's where the problem of Christianity comes. Christianity is saying that we are the holders of the fulfillment of the divine law sent to Jews. They're saying that Jews are the chosen people of God on earth, and that they were given all these revelations, and they had this very important special prophecy, known as the prophecy of the Messiah, the special anointed prophet who will come and bring them back to the greatness of Israel, the people carrying the law and following it as they were intended. And so they're saying that that was Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Christ meaning Messiah is a Greek term. And so the problem comes that while they're affirming that Jews were the people with given all this revelation in scripture and miracles and they had this Messiah and Jesus, the one whom they follow, is the fulfillment of that. But they're saying that Jesus was God. No Jew ever believed that the awaited Messiah would would be God or God's literal son simply because no Jew has ever believed in, in all Jewish theology, theological interpretations. God cannot and would not become human. God would cease to be God at that point. God would then have limitations, which whenever I was having a debate with an evangelical seminary professor um, and I asked him about in chapter Matthew where Jesus was questioned about the day of judgment and Jesus then says, No man, no angel, not the Son, knows the day of judgment, only the Father in heaven. And so when I asked this uh, professor of, of Christian theology, he said, this is a very tough conundrum, but what it looks like is when God decided to become human, he knew he would have to limit himself, meaning he would somehow not be fully God. Because in the beginning of the discussion, he affirmed that God is omniscient, omniscience, absolute knowledge, right? That is God. Now he's saying God is Jesus, but Jesus doesn't have that. So we're having a demigod here, right? But he doesn't want to admit that. He's saying God is mysterious. God is beyond your comprehension. So leave logic and reason out of it, right? I watched another debate in Michigan when a group of evangelical um, people who are following a so-called Muslim who converted Christian, um, uh, they're saying that, you know, we have to have an understanding of the nature of God. But before we go into that, Muslims tend to be very logic-oriented. 
but Christians are very spiritually, emotionally oriented. Guess who was saying that? This was the guy who was going to argue on behalf of Christianity. He said that very boldly. My argument to that would be, I'm not even going to listen to this debate because what makes a human distinct from all other beings in a very clear fashion is rational logic. Our, our intellectual capacity. For God to cho- choose us and make us special and distinct in such a way and then say, yeah, dismiss all of that and accept something about me that's completely irrational, it doesn't seem like a God that is reasonable. <laughs> I'm not willing to worship that God. <laughs> and so the Quran is telling us, no, you will come to know of your purpose of life and you will see how prophets were affirming previous messages and you will see the overlap of their teachings. Prophet Muhammad is saying things that, oh, I noticed that, I noticed this, I recognize this, I recognize that. And from the miraculous angle of this, Prophet Muhammad did not spend any considerable time with any Jews or Christians. Some Christians try to point that he went on a two or three journeys to Syria whenever he was a merchant, a trader. Number one, he doesn't read and write his own language, according to everybody's observation, according to the Quran as well. And number two, if he would have known any Aramaic or any Hebrew, which I'd probably doubt any he knew, but if he knew Aramaic because in Syria they were speaking that, he would have known just like a lot of folks that come from Mexico and they come here and do business, but they stay amongst their family. It's a very basic level. It's not like any sophisticated, deep philosophical understanding of scripture, right? And nobody ever accused, even his own uncle, that when we went there, he spent all this time. Nobody has ever made that accusation amongst his enemies of the Arabs, the Quraysh, that when he used to go on these trips, people saw him spending time with the monks or the priests or the rabbis or whatever, right? Um, So each prophet is confirming what other prophets say. Um, So this, this verse... Confirming previous scriptures, it's like many places in the Quran. I'm going to say dozens. God emphasizes the fact that this revelation confirms previous revelations, which pre- confirmed previous revelations, and, and that, is for, that is familiar to all prophets. While God and the general message is clear. So who is God? What is your purpose in life in its generality? Love God, love your neighbor, create a just peace society, Um, Keep up with regular prayer and charity, fasting, all of those things, honoring family, mother, father, all of those things are fundamental teachings you find across the board. But God abrogates some laws and teachings, some specific laws, some specific rules that in God's wisdom for these people who are in this circumstance, it would be relevant for them, but it won't be relevant for these people. And we find that even within the final revelation where scholars have identified literal teachings which are not useful to different people at different times. And literal teachings that are for circumstances, but if you don't understand the story of the Qur'an, the Prophet's life as he received it, then you might be confused. You know, I I often challenge people um, who go into this literalism um, and also people who, Islamophobes, they come against Muslims. And so when somebody gets literal and they say, this is what the ayah says, this is what the hadith says, you have to follow it exactly. And I understand from Islamic jurisprudence that this person doesn't understand the context or how it should, what is the point and the value that this revelation re- represents in its application. And they say, no, we should follow everything exactly as it says. Then I say, okay, the Quran says, فَقُتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُهُمْ Kill the polytheists wherever you find them. So when you see your Hindu friend, you got to pull out your gun and blast him, right? And they're like, no, that's not what it says. And I'm so, oh, Mr. Literalist, you need to go study your scripture before you start claiming ideologies, right? And so then when I show it to them, they're like, confounded. Because they've really never studied the religion, but they feel empowered by this literalist approach. So then the Islamophobe was like, see, you're admitting Islam says kill the infidels. I've got you, right? And I say, okay, let me ask you this question. The 44 million Christian Arabs who've been living there since the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the one point whatever billion Hindus who were ruled by a caliphate, a theocratic Sharia-based Islamic state for 700 years, how are those people all there if that's the way we understand this verse to be applied? 
This verse was understood to be about the Quraysh, a specific set of polytheists who had time and time again, over the whole time the Quran was being revealed to the Prophet, broke treaties, brought armies to destroy them, and constantly attacked and abused and humiliated them. So God was saying, these people, we cannot no longer make peace treaties with them. They have proved at every turn that they are treacherous people who are going to create problems. Now that the, I would say, 90 plus percent of Arabia are Muslim, and this is the land of pilgrimage, and Islam needs to grow and spread, and people need to know it across the world. People will want to come make their pilgrimage. But if they know there's these polytheists around there, right? So the previous ayahs before this said they have four months to figure out what they're going to do. With the remaining polytheists, they can leave, okay? As the Prophet said, أَخْرِجُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ مِنْ جَزِيرَةِ الْعَرَبِ Get, Remove the polytheists from this land. Or they can look into Islam and study it, and see if that's maybe the religion they want. Or there will be a fight. If you want to fight, we'll fight it out. But there's no more peace treaty and then you break it and cause problems and people die and everybody's fearing and all of that kind of thing, right? Um, so um, this is where we see that certain laws may be relevant to situations or people and God will reveal different things for different people. So our scholars knowing that the final revelation is in the Quran and the Sunnah, they know that there are certain teachings which might be relevant at some time and not relevant at another so in this context, in Surah Al-Imran, the third uh, chapter of the Quran, 50th verse, Jesus is telling his followers, confirming the mess- I'm, I'm confirming the message of the Torah while I permit to you to do some things previously prohibited to you. So Jesus was telling the Jews that I will permit you to do some things that previous scripture in the Torah and the previous law of prophets had said you cannot do. And we see that in their community. I wouldn't, there's actually no basis to say that Jesus ever approved of eating pork. He would have never ate pork. But guess where pork was very common? Rome, where Christianity was founded, right? So the idea of God being a human being, the idea of God coming down on earth and having kids, those are very Roman mythological beliefs. The idea of pork being a normal, natural thing to eat. No Jew would have ever accepted any of these ideas, right? From A to Z. But because the actual, what we call Christianity, was not formed anywhere near Jewish people. There were no Jewish people there. There were people who are claiming to be priests who, like are two or three generations after Paul, who wrote some letters to the people of Greece and Rome. And so they're saying this is the message. But those people were never part of a Jewish family observing Jewish laws ever. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of people don't pay attention to this because it's an emotional, spiritual religion and not a factual, logical, historical assessment of reality in scripture. You see, that's our approach. So there were many scriptures sent. We are told about the Abrahamic scriptures. Prophet Abraham has been singled out by God and it's very clear in the Quran as a leader of humanity, as a special reference prophet for humanity. When this was being said, probably a small percentage of humanity would have said that. Today, well over 70% of all people on earth that believe in God attribute their belief in God to Abraham as a forefather, right? So that's a prophecy fulfilled. So because Prophet Muhammad is the grandson of Abraham through Ishmael, um, and the Israelites were the children of Abraham through Isaac, and Jesus would have been through that bloodline. Um, this Abrahamic story of prophets and messages and scriptures is emphasized. But the Quran tells us here in chapter 4, verse 164, there are messengers we told you about their story, and there are others we did not. And this, there's hadith that come into the commentary of this, that God sent over 300 messengers to humanity and over 124,000 prophets, right? So all of humanity has had prophets. The natives of this land, the natives of South America, the people of Russia, Africa, all of those people have had in their nations prophets sent to them, which is probably the root of all religions. All religions were originally a prophet teaching them. So like, so some people, when you tell them this, they've been kind of taught like, a lot of Muslims think like Jews and Christians don't realize it. 
because the colonization kind of recalibrated them, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, God did not only send to 25 prophets. I don't know how many, like you'll see in some mosques, they have these are the 25 prophets and their lineage. And then the average person comes through their thinking, there were only 25 prophets sent to humanity and only one people, God's racist. Right? Yeah. God didn't care about the rest of humanity as we know it. Anthropologically, we know that there was much more to humanity, right? The Quran tells us otherwise. So it would make no sense and there would be no way to memorize and record easily a scripture that tells all these stories of these prophets that nobody would have any way of relating to whatsoever in the Arabian Peninsula when it was revealed, right? So we have everything we need to understand. Like when I read shamanistic proverbs and the writings of natives and there's what they say are spiritual sages, what they learned from the great spirit, right? You find stuff that looks just like Quranic ayahs. And they're like, yeah, we've had this before Columbus and them, before. So clearly God had been sending them things, right? Um, when you look into Buddhism, when you look into even Confucianism and, and all of that, you see these things. Um, so what are the sources of revelation? The Qur'an is the final revelation sent by God to the final messenger. So that's all you need to know, right? Somebody would say, well, what about other scriptures? The Qur'an refers to itself, and I'm not sure if I put this point. Um, yeah, I didn't put this point. But the Qur'an refers to itself as the Muhammad, the preserving criterion or reference. So if somebody writes a self-help book or a philosophy book, if Karl Marx, Karl Marx writes a book, we can look at that and say, that fits with God's will. That's an alignment with God's will. Or if they're saying it was a scripture, we could say that probably was scripture, right? Uh, one person told me, yeah, but how are you saying Buddha was probably a prophet when look at his message? And I'm like, okay, was Jesus a prophet? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, but look at his message. You, you can't judge by what's here today. Because people are people. People mess things up. Um, and that's the second point we have here. The Qur'an tells us of another revelation that has been meticulously preserved alongside it. So the Qur'an is not the only revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. It is the reference for God's word. It's like the constitutional reference point of divine knowledge and wisdom. So everything that God wants us to know from a principled understanding of divine purpose in creating humanity and guiding them is in the Qur'an. But the, the full clarity of that is only known in the Sunnah. And so the Qur'an uh, in chapter 4 verse 113, God has revealed to you the Qur'an and the wisdom. So God's talking directly to the Prophet and then to all of us who carry his message that he sent the Qur'an and the wisdom, right? So if we look in the commentaries, in the earliest commentaries, we have preserved referencing that we can authenticate that go back to people who knew the Prophet Muhammad and people who were their students. 1,440 years ago, we know what those people thought. Pretty much all of them say this wisdom is the sunnah. It's the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So when we look at the linguistic connotation of the word wisdom, Wisdom is the beneficial practical usage of knowledge. When to do what I should do and why I should do it when and what's the best way of doing that. What's the best way of saying that? We call that wisdom, right? So as a scripture by itself, we would all be battling as to what would be the wisdom of actually living this message as a theory. But when you look at the lived example of Prophet Muhammad, then you can say that's how the Qur'an is lived. And that's exactly what Aisha said, which I also, I think I forgot to put in here. But how do we know that that's what it means? Because the Qur'an tells us in chapter 4 verse 80, whoever obeys the messenger has certainly obeyed God. Right? So for the, the you will meet people if you haven't met them yet. They're called the Qur'anists, the Qur'an only people. And this is a group that has actually been formed in the last 80 years. Basically, after modernity and Muslims trying to make their way to some sort of sense of the world in a modern world where Muslims are weak and poor and oppressed and they're in, they've internalized Islamophobia, right? Islamophobia was there before September 11th. It just got massively like 10 times the dial turned up 
but it's always been there in writings, in the writings of Orientalists who write European writers and Western writers about Islam. They vilify and make it look bad. And when you look at the Muslim world, it's not a very happy place to celebrate, right? So people start to say, yeah, we don't believe in Sunnah. That's all just made up. Because in their mind, the Sunnah has all these things that are hard to explain to Western modern people. Meaning what? Their gauge for morality is modern Western people. And these people have not paid uh, very well attention because we're seeing right now the modern Western people are just gung ho about a genocide. Let's let's wipe the let's mop the floor with these Palestinian people, these little kids. Like, what's wrong with you, the leader of the free world, the most modern, technologically advanced place? Like, what does that mean? These people have caused more death and destruction, humiliation, more hypocrisy. Then about how many Muslims worldwide are trying to fit in with them and be like them in every single way. I'm not saying don't, don't be educated. I'm not saying don't be a modern person that enjoys modern things. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the, the source of morality. Who decides right and wrong? And for which reason, right? So whoever obeys the messenger would know the actual practical lived example of God's message in the Qur'an. The Qur'an says, obey, the God, and, obey God and the messenger. If, if that's the same thing as Qur'anists say, why doesn't God just say obey God? Why does he make it obey God and the messenger? Why does he say obeying the prophet is obeying God? You see what I'm saying? If, if, if all his job is to do is to just tell people the Qur'an, and then die and be forgotten as a person, which is basically the Qur'anist argument, which the Qur'an also says in other places, you have the best example to follow in the Messenger of God, right? Um, so this is why we know that this is a source of revelation. And when we say we know, we're talking about the mainstream of Muslims, um, which account for about 86, 87% of Muslims, well over a billion people. Um, they are all in agreement that there is a Qur'an and a Sunnah, right? Even the Shiites, who account for 13-14% of Muslims, they say that there is a tradition, but most of what they call tradition, they go back to imams. But they still believe the need to go back to people to explain the Qur'an, and they believe that that should be followed. They just don't have chains of transmission. They just have a very, sound familiar, emotional spiritual attachment and reverence for these imams, the 12 people after the Prophet that were holy and nur. You say, okay, you're saying Jafar al-Sadiq said, and I'm saying, how do you know that? They said, because the book says so. I said, but how do you know that that book is telling the truth? They said, of course, some pious person wrote this book. And I'm like, yeah, you know, this sounds very Christianity to me, if you ask me. Let's say, I can't go along with that, right? So for us, we'd say, that hadith sounds beautiful. How do you know the Prophet said it? We can then go on so-and-so, told so-and-so, told so-and-so, that person lived in that era, met that person, this person's memory, knowledge of the Arabic language. Like, we're talking about a very massive undertaking, which we'll talk about. Now, what is the sunnah? The word sunnah means a way of doing something, a pattern of behavior. That's what it literally means in Arabic. Like we say, uh, like for example, uh, sunnati, um, is that I usually wake up, pray Fajr, and then I go to the gym and work out. That's my sunnah, right? Now, Fajr, I learned from the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, right? And working out at the gym, this is my own sunnah, right? Prophet Wasallam taught being well, you know, well, you know, I guess healthy and to learn uh, horseback riding and wrestling and swimming and all those things. Um, but I don't think he worked out at a gym. But that's my sunnah, Right? So the Qur'an talks about sunnatullah, the way of God, meaning how creation operates, right? How he expects people to operate. Um, so specifically, it means the lived example of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. That's the sunnah. How would we know that something is sunnah because the shaykh said so? No, that is not the sunnah. That is a very, again, believing whatever rabbi or priest says is not our way or imam, right? Imam has to be able to explain to you why. I know that. Here is the reference. Here is the point. Here is the evidence. So what are hadiths? Hadiths are the recorded statements, examples, and approvals of the Prophet Muhammad when it comes to religion and things like that specifically. So any a hadith is like, so-and-so said, so-and-so said, so-and-so said, so-and-so said, so-and-so said, the Prophet said such and such. Right? And so... 
then or did such and such or approved of. Because if the Prophet, if it says, we did such and such and the Prophet acknowledged it and then moved on, we know that that behavior is acceptable, right? Because as a Prophet, he has to commend, he has to tell people what the law is. And so if he does not rebuke something that he witnesses, then therefore it's an acceptable behavior, right? So that's what we call tacit approval. So there are all these millions of hadith. How do we know about those? So at first they were memorized and shared by word for 78 years after the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Right? So if you know the Arabs, you know they were not reading and writing. They were an illiterate community. Most of the world was. The idea of going to school and learning to read and write didn't start till the Muslims instituted it in Egypt and Morocco about, you know, 800, 700, 800 common era. 800 common era, yeah. So the world basically operated like this. You come up in your village, in your family, there's farmers, there's blacksmiths, there's carpenters, there's traders, there's warriors. And so then you, your family, you go become an apprentice. And so you learn the trade of the family. You don't learn to read and write, read books and all that stuff. That's most of world history did not do that, right? Like in Greece and Rome, there was a special upper echelon of people who did that. Plato, Aristotle and all that. You're, you should not imagine a whole society of people who have books and read, Right. Maybe, maybe the percentage in Greece and Rome was maybe 20, 25%. Um, but I would say much of the world was probably around 10%. People who are very instrumental in scribing what needs to be known and what needs to be recorded. Arabs were probably less than 5%. That's why they're called the illiterate nation. Now, some people say, oh, that makes them dumb. Because now we equate someone who doesn't read and write as someone who's uneducated. No, Arabs were actually very intellectual. They were people who had trades and businesses and responsibilities. Um, they just were very proud of their language. And so the fluid nature of pure Arabic is a very poetic language. Um, they memorize things a lot. They would memorize whole long poems when they heard them. Um, so it was very common for them. So like right now, we all have phones. How many of you know more than two or three telephone numbers? When, okay, mashallah, Jackson still got it. When I was a kid, I remember like 15 different phone numbers. I had mom, dad, school, uh, mom's work, dad's work, had, you know, uh, friends, like five, ten friends. I would memorize all those because I had to. You see what I'm saying? But now you don't have to, so you don't, right? You see what I'm saying? So they were very adamant. So to act like, oh, well, then therefore this casts a doubt over the whole thing and probably it's all doubtful. The pro one of the most consequential hadiths is the Prophet saying, مَنْ كَذِبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدُهُ مِنَ النَّارِ That hadith was narrated by dozens of companions, meaning he said it at many times to many people. And it's seen as the backbone. Whoever would lie and attribute that lie as a teaching of mine will go to hell. The Prophet Muhammad said. Meaning, this is the biggest travesty. You, there's no room for anybody inventing something and claiming that that's the message of God, right? So those people were very adamant. So some people would say because Abu Bakr was the closest friend of the Prophet. Why doesn't he narrate so many hadiths? When somebody asked him about this, he said, I'm not going to say something as I'm crystal clear sure that's what the Prophet had said, right? Aisha narrates a lot. Anas bin Malik, Abdullah bin Umar, Abu Huraira. Those people were always around the Prophet as well. But they were scholarly discussing, like they were always in scholarly discussions about these hadiths. Right? Abu Bakr was in the business of leading a whole entire society and dealing with a civil war, right? So, and then he died two years later, right? So, um, yeah, so then Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great pious caliph that came, he then told all of the believers, we need to now start, now that people are starting to become much more literate and people are getting more educated, we need a reference point for everybody. So we need to go find out who are the ones narrating hadith. So he told them two things. Write a hadith, but then whoever's telling you that hadith, find out everything you can about that person. Ask their mom, their dad, their brother, the imam of the mosque, who is this guy? Who is this lady? Right? And for the ladies, it is a disproportionate amount because historically women felt this big responsibility of family and being a mother and all of that. But there are thousands of women who are narrators of hadith in our t tradition. There was never any woman ever accused of lying when narrating a hadith. While there are thousands of men who were accused of lying when narrating the hadith. Um, so he said, you know, we want you to search for and meticulously compile and codify what you know about the Prophet. That went on for four centuries. 
400 years, Muslims were traveling to far east India from Baghdad, right? And traveling far west Africa, like the Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, all of that. There are people traveling everywhere to find anybody. They would go through a village. Has anybody ever here claimed Prophet Muhammad said such and such? And say, yeah, we knew of a person. I know of somebody who knows of somebody. And then they find that person and then they start recording and they start writing about that person. So then they had gathered all the hadiths and all of the biographies of hadith claimers, narrators of hadith. And so this system is recognized by all social scientists as the most sophisticated, meticulous uh, system of verification ever in humanity. We were all, when we were like, what, first grade? And they're like, okay, the frog jumped off the log into the river. And then it goes around 20 kids and it comes back. The frog's liver flipped out and saw its mother. You know? <laughs> yeah, we don't have that problem. Because why? We found hadiths in India that have completely different narrators. Same hadith in Morocco. Right? That's, that's pinpoint. How is it possible that they all go back with different narrators to the Prophet and yet they have the exact same words exactly as they are in that one? Or it's the wording's a little bit different, but it's the same general meaning. The scholar said it doesn't need to be. It's not, it's not the Quran. It's not God's words. It's God's message communicated to the Prophet. A lot of people get confused about this issue. I was actually confused about it until I was like, I was like in my fifth, sixth year studying Sharia. And I was reading some hadith and reading about a hadith book uh, about the um, sciences of hadith. And so I was, because in my mind, basically, Angel Gabriel is telling the Prophet all these things. And so like, these are like, the Prophet Muhammad is saying them. They're not actually Quran. They're not God's word. But like everything he's saying that's a hadith is like he's been told to say that. Actually, the Prophet was legislated and given the right of legislation. And so the Prophet was given an inspiration by God, a blessing from God, that you will have this Qur'an in you, and you will live it and teach it to the people. And you will communicate to them how they should understand and follow this message. So the Prophet from his own. Now on a handful of occasions, God corrects the Prophet in the Qur'an. And so that was an, a, a crystallized way of saying, your humanness overpowered your connection to Scripture here or your divine, access to divine wisdom, right? And so here's what you should do, or here's what you should have done, right? Um, which again, doesn't fit the MO of a false prophet. Usually a false prophet is a narcissistic. You don't go around saying, and now I did that wrong, right? Because nobody would know, like, like you're just making stuff up anyways. So you would just stick with everything you say as the absolute truth because you're this prophet that you're imagining as some great uh, person. Um, so yeah, so this is, I think, I think this is all about revelation.